Well, if someone's just like, who are you? What do you do? And you're like in a car somewhere, what's your like quick little identifier? Started with a chain of gyms out of Southern California. I sold those, kept- God damn, I didn't need the whole life story. If I was a golden doodle, how would you explain what acquisition.com is? We do nuclear nuclear fusion. You know, we cure all diseases and we can reverse aging. I didn't really mean to go super balls deep. You want a good cack. It's already too big, in my opinion, too large for any person to stop. What the man. We're going to go and not sleep for a month and like walk on fire. I'm just going to dance on TikTok now. And I'm just too much of a pussy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Don't Be Sour, episode number 36. I'm your host, Max Tuning. We're here with the man with the greatest beard on the internet <laughs> who might enjoy talking about Chipotle even more than I do. Mr. Alex Hermosi. Thank you for having me. How you doing, man? I'm amped to be here. I'm actually pretty, uh, I feel like you're just slightly disappointed. You, you thought I owned a bunch of companies. You're not the first person because in my bio, it, it just links them down below. So people are like, damn, you own movement and ghost. And that's what I said. I was and like, then the other two companies I don't know about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. I, uh, well, I'm glad that you worked with those guys because it's still very cool brands. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, why don't, uh, for the people that don't know you, why don't you just, uh, I like to say like, what's your Uber pitch of if someone's just like, who are you? What do you do? and you're like in a car somewhere, what's your like quick little identifier? Uh, started with a chain of gyms out of the Southern California. I sold those, kept the IP, started licensing the model to just under 5,000. Actually, I think we're just over 5,000 locations now. Um, sold two thirds of that company last year uh, and some ancillary companies that went with that uh, at 46.2 46 million um, to a private equity firm out of San Francisco. Um, and during that whole period of time, it was a very cash flow positive company. Uh, and so we started doing a lot of private investing. And uh, right now, uh, we started acquisition.com. Not right now, I mean, two years ago. I started acquisition.com, and that portfolio of companies does about $200 million a year. Um, I always want to be like, and I have. <laughs> um, and I make a lot of content now uh, just to help other people do it too. And hopefully, uh, grow their businesses big enough that we could you know, invest in them someday. That's what you would tell an Uber driver? Yeah. <laughs> that exact specific. Well, I have a long ride. I got 10 minutes. He's going to just have to listen to it. You know? <laughs> He's like, God damn, I didn't need the whole life story. Yeah. <laughs> well, so like generally when I interview like any sort of guest, I like to do some sort of, you know, deep dive on them. So I don't come in fully looking like an idiot, but I, I like to also not, you know, know everything about them. So I'm kind of fresh and I'm very, you know, on the internet, you're the, the hundred million dollar man. Everyone likes to refer yeah. to you as, do you like that name? I mean, it'll, it's, a little under now and it's, you know, in five years I'll hate the name. So you know. it's kind of disrespectful to only call me the hundred million dollar man. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm honored. It's very nice. It, I'm flattered by it. And a lot of it is because of the book. So a hundred million dollar offers was, cause I think at that point when I wrote the book, um, you know, we'd done 120 million ish in cumulative sales. And so I was like, here's the stuff that we learned about making offers. And so I just put it in the book and I think people just took that title and, you know, slapped it on me. Do you think people who like own businesses or whatever, when they get to $1 million, they like to refer themselves to as a millionaire. Is that like when the moment you hit a hundred million dollars, like I'm a hundred millionaire. I actually made a, uh, a video about this, but there's like seven different ways I've seen people talk about like their net worth. Most of them false, but there's like how much total sales I've done over the lifetime of my business is like total revenue. And then it's, um, you know, one step underneath that would be uh, like the value of the company based on equity. And then another one underneath that would be like what their current run rate is. And then another one is like what their profit is. And then another one would be like what their cash flow is. And so I'll say one of the things that I have feel like I've learned is like the wealthier you become, the more amorphous what net worth even means is. Amorphous. Because, yeah, it's just, it's muddy, it's murky. It's not uh, it, like, when you're poor, you know exactly what you have because you don't have much and you can count it on your fingers, right? Yeah. When you have a lot, then it's like, well, what's the value of the 28% stake I have in this business that we're not planning on selling and we're reinvesting profits into? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I could probably sell that to different people for different prices. Like, and then it would, it would, so a lot of, a lot of assets aren't liquid. And so even, even when you, it's kind of funny because like going through the sale process, you get a big chunk of cash. And then after that, you then have to allocate the cash. So when people are like, oh, this guy's worth a billion dollars, it's not like he has a billion dollars in his bank account. Right. He just owns something that is worth a billion dollars, which is very different. You know, the only time that it's, I feel like it's more accurate is once you go into a public market, the equities you have are tradable and you can take loans against them, you know, immediately. And so in that way, you really are, at least in my opinion, like the billion is more real yeah. <laughs> uh, than if you're in private equities, uh, which, you know, things are illiquid. It takes six to 12 months to be able to sell or kind of have, transact in any way. And it's 
based on what the market looks like then and what buyers are available. Do you think a lot of people say different, you brought up a lot of good points about when, when I, when you talk to businesses of like, yeah, our business, you know, it, it's like, how much have you done? They're like $50 million. That That's crazy. Like, you know, 2022, they're like, well, no, like lifetime. Yeah. Do you think there's a reason why some people will, like there's different types of personalities yeah. of business of like, when I say a revenue number, it's that year, not yeah. lifetime. Mm -hmm. And then even, it was relatively recent to me. I never ran into someone um, until uh, talking about like run rate mm -hmm. of like, that's not what they're actually gonna do this year. That's like what they would do if this best month mm continued for the next 12 months, mm. that's what they would do. Like, why do you think people, I don't, I don't want to say they can inflate it, but is, do you think that's kind of like what they're doing? Yeah. Making it sound better than it. Yeah. Not that it's bad, but yeah, I think it's status. Yeah. So it's like, it's always a way of like bumping their status, like up one level, like rounding up. It's something that I actually work on a lot is like, try not to round up. I like, I'm not, I'm not perfect at it, but like, I try not to round up. Um, You're a round downer. I actually, I want to be accurate. So 46.2. That yeah, was I noticed number. that he said you know that, like, I mean? like yeah. it's not more or less. And then trying not to qualify it because to very rich people, that is nothing. And to very poor people, that is everything. And so I can't guess what someone's going to see by that. So it's just, that's what it is. Okay. And with acquisition.com, if I was a golden doodle, how would you explain what acquisition.com is? We are minority investors in companies that are between three and a hundred million a year. And so we take minority stakes typically between 20 and 33% of those businesses. Um, and we, depending on the business, we're either investing for cash flow for some sort of return, or we're reinvesting cash into the business so that we can eventually sell it later. It really just depends on the business. Is it a long-term hold? Is it like a fix and flip? Um, it just depends on the business, but typically we are minority investors in those companies and we bring a lot of hands-on help uh, to grow the business. And so we get discounts um, for the valuations, et cetera, that we invest in those companies because we are hands-on, which yeah. is not typical for minority partners. Most times they write the check and they want to ride, you know, just ride along and usually just get the, uh, the founder some sort of uh, cash. No cash usually ha exchanges hands uh, from us to the founder because we're either investing into the business so that it can grow or we're doing something in kind because it's uh, based on the amount of value that we're going to provide. I noticed when I went to acquisition.com, there's not that golden doodle spiel on mm -hmm. it. It's like, as just soon as you go in, you, you just like have to know what, is it like you have to know what it is to, like you should know what it is before you even go to the website type of thing? I think it's just because the vast majority of people that do go to the site do know what it is because they've consumed something or multiple things of my, like in order for somebody to say, oh, I'm going to go to acquisition.com, um, they would usually have consumed at least, you know, a few pieces of content of mine before they would go there. I mean, if they click, you know, investment thesis or any of the other, you know, links on there, but, you know, I come from a direct response background. And so having something that's optimized for, uh, for conversion is always forefront of mind. And so, you know, if I had a big paragraph of what we do on the, on the homepage, I guarantee you, I would have fewer deals that would be coming to me. You think you have fewer deals? hundred percent. Hmm. I could prove it. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. And did, did you, were you able to snag acquisition.com or do you have to buy that? I bought it. How much did the website cost you? I think it was 370 something. Three hundred and seventy dollars. Thousand. What the fuck? Yeah. Was it? Was it someone just? What they call it, like domain squatting or domain shark? Mm -hmm. It wasn't like someone had a business and you're like, hey, you're no, I can do better. It's just the name. What the fuck, man? Yeah. Did you talk it down? What was the original price? No, I just came in and asked. They were in talks for somebody else. And you're not a negotiator. I am, but. It's like, what's the, what's the goal? You know what I mean? For me, the cost of negotiating it, cause you had another buyer that they had been haggling with. And so I figured that the seller was kind of tired of haggling with this other guy for like, I think the number that they were at was like 325 or something like that. And they were trying to create some sort of payment plan. Or something. And I was like, I'll pay 370 today cash. Just wire it to like, I can wire it tomorrow. Um, and so the deal closed in like two days and they had been in talks for like two months. Yeah. Um, and and the, so for me, it's like, what's the, like, is there actually a difference in how much value I'm going to get out of something if I pay $50,000 less or the downside risk of me just not getting it for me is significantly higher. Um, and I would say that one of the things that I have changed over time is that I used to haggle every single nickel and dime and I value speed more now because the opportunity cost of the time that I wouldn't have it, I will, I'll make more money having it sooner and I'll make up the cost difference with speed. I guess, I guess in my brain, not, I mean, I know, you know, uh, it's all relative to, I guess, your income totally. that, that you have, but in my head, I'm like, don't you think like an email of like, would you take 350? <laughs> Save you $20,000? It just wasn't. 
it is what it is at this point. I want to just get the deal done. How many of the businesses that acquisition.com invest in, would you say get acquired? Cause that's the end, end goal. Like to mm-hmm. the, the businesses that would sell, would you say, do you have like a success rate or anything? So for us, we're two years in um, to uh, the minority investment. So even in a normal deal cycle, you know, I probably wouldn't sell it. Like, unless we're just flipping a company, which is not really our model. Like I would prefer to hold all of them forever. That's my preference. I am a minority in a minority position though. And so if the founder's like, I really want to sell, then we'll say, okay, then let's get it ready to sell. And that might take 24 months to like, you know, do a couple of low hanging fruit, increase the cash flow, you know, add a couple of value adds that would be, you know, significantly increase the enterprise value of the multiple we'd be able to get on the company. Um, and then we can, you know, go to market and that going to market process takes 12 months just on its own. Like once the company's ready, it's another year. Do you think a lot of people invest, obviously they, they get it from you, but like, do they expect that Alex is going to promote my company now, or is that not really part of the, like you're, you're going for my expertise of myself yeah. and my team. It's not that you're going to be a spokes model for look at this chapstick brand that I invested in. Correct. So I am not, uh, I don't, I don't endorse any of the, the companies that we have. Um, and there's, there's a couple reasons for that. One is if I'm going to really endorse something, I do want to have it for a very long time or forever. Um, I usually want to have control. So I'd want to be majority likely, or at least 50, 50 in the business most times. Um, that, I mean, there are special circumstances if it's a massive company and like, it would make sense. I'd be open to it, but it would definitely be an additional, like an additional negotiating point. The biggest risk for me is brand. Yeah. Uh, and so like, you know, making an endorsement is, is a big investment because I'm really betting that this guy, gal company is not going to do anything really dumb. And that's tough because there's a lot of people in businesses. You know, if, if you're head of marketing, you know, DM some girl who's underage and he doesn't, and it becomes this whole thing. And then my brand gets associated with yeah. that. It's there's just like, I can control me. And so if I'm going to do it, I want to have as much control as I can. Um, and so that's why I don't normally do it that way. It's also a little bit of a risk to the business because if I'm a huge driver of value to the business in terms of percentage of sales, et cetera, um, then it does make it more difficult to sell because then the acquirer would have to make a deal with me and a deal with the company. Right. So we do this ultimately to make the companies independently more valuable rather than make them dependent on us, which is kind of like the fast track band aid, but I think long term robs them of the value that we that they could make on their own. You're you're, you're essentially, I mean, not like, do people just compare you to Shark Tank, kind of, sort of, all the time. <laughs> you're, you're like a b- better looking Kevin O'Leary. <laughs> <laughs> a more jacked Kevin O'Leary. Yeah. Yeah. With more significantly jacked. more hair. Yeah. You know, speaking of, <laughs> speaking of, I guess like, you know, bringing up shark tank and the acquisition and, and uh, you know, percentages and minority stakes, yeah. a lot of people that, you know, and I'll, I'll refer to shark tank. Cause I think a lot of people understand mm-hmm. that show. Um, you'll see a lot of people come in and maybe, you know, people, Hey, Alex, I want you to invest in this. We're doing what I see a lot on sh- episodes is, is people, undervaluing valuing or overvaluing their company. And mm-hmm. a lot of times, even I'm a little bit confused when the sharks or you would be like, it's not worth that. If, if some of companies like, you know, we're, we're doing $10 million in sales. Mm-hmm. Our business is worth telling $10 million and they get they're like, no, it's not. It's only worth how much cash you have in the bank. Like mm-hmm. what is the biggest misconception people have with value with valuations beyond like their own ego of like, no, it's, it's worth a whole lot of money. Yeah. So Fundamentally, when somebody's buying a company, they're buying a percentage of future profits, right? And so the question is, how how profitable will the company be if it's in the future? How long is that sustainable? And what is my risk associated with that? And so if there's if there's a business that's incredibly transactional, has a single point of failure, that's founder-led, and they're the face, and they're the one that drives all the business, that person gets hit by a bus, the company's dead, right? That person gets in a scandal, the company's dead. And so you want to have as few, like you want to have multiple stream, you know, multiple different sources of acquisition. You want to have customers that return for a very long time. You want to have some sort of unique mechanism if possible that gives, and it could not necessarily even be about the product. It'd be a unique mechanism for acquisition. It could be unique, uh, like just some element that makes it a little bit different that gives some sort of competitive advantage or cushion against the new entrant that's going to try and just copy and rip off the same thing. Brand would be an example of that, which is why like Warren Buffett talks about buying big brands. Like anybody can recreate the Apple iPhone. I mean, shoot, China does it all the time, Yeah, uh, but they can't recreate Apple. Right. And so like a brand in and of itself would be something that's valuable. And so when they're thinking about that, like, you know, values of businesses are so uh, murky, right? I don't mm-hmm. use amorphous, but they're so, they're so variable. I like the word. You keep yeah. using it, dude. <laughs> amorphous. I'm going to add that into yeah. my vocabulary. They're, uh, 
they're they're a moving target. You know, it also depends on the, the the capital environment. So if you can borrow money at a cheaper rate, values of companies go up. Same like real estate, because if you can get money cheaper, in general, the whole market starts trading higher. If it's money more expensive, then the the the, the companies trade lower. And so there's just there's a ton of different variables that go into it. And then also what the company is going to get from the acquirer. So like if a strategic buyer, so a company, so to define that, if a company buys another company and the company that bought it would directly benefit uh, from adding that company to its kind of portfolio, like it can cross sell its existing customers into those services uh, or products, then that company will make more from the acquisition than what a financial buyer would be. So like if a family office, a rich, you know, rich guy just wants to buy a piece of a business or the whole business, he doesn't have any strategic plays. He's just going to buy it for what it is. And so like financial buyers tend to buy businesses for less than strategic buyers do. Mm. So you want to find a strategic buyer if you can, but those deals take longer. There's more integration. There's typically, you know, a one or two year consult back period where the founder has to like make sure it fully, you know, transitions. There's probably some sort of earnout or kickers along with how, how well it does with that transition. Cause some of the value, the enterprise value that gets ascribed is based on how much more money we're together going to be able to make. And so um, there's a lot of factors that go into how you value a business. But at the end of the day, it's just what someone is willing to pay. That's true. It's kind of like, it's kind of like when someone goes to sell anything, it's like, like it's worth this much, like it's only worth as much as someone's willing to pay for it's the it. It's market. It's like, if you have a $50,000 watch or you think someone's gonna buy it, but no one wants to pay 50,000, it's not worth $50,000. If you sell in 2009 versus 2021, same business, you get a different number. Yeah. You know, and I, I didn't really mean to go super balls deep on acquisitions and whatnot, By but means. something, um, else is a lot of people get caught up in raising money. A lot mm -hmm. of businesses, what, what is your, what is your take on the people who either are super prideful that they've never taken money and they're yeah. super cash flow positive, Um, and they're, I guess a slower grower, mm -hmm. right. Um, versus someone who's, I want to raise tons of money, dilute myself or my company mm -hmm. because of this big exit. I mean, there's, I guess there's strategies to both. Totally. So I think there's a right way and a wrong way to use, to raise money. Um, the right way of raising money is that you have all the base business economics correct. So I'll give you an example. So let's say uh, you have a, a product or a software that costs a hundred bucks a month, right? And somebody stays on average for 40 months. So it's a $4,000 LTV, but it costs you, let's say $500 to get that customer. Well, that would mean that the business is going to lose money for the first five months before they even break even on gross margin, like let alone run all the rest of the business just on spending to acquire, it takes them five months to break even. And then right. they'll make their first quote dollar of gross profit that they can, you know, start paying payroll and other stuff in. In that instance, it makes sense for them to raise money to more rapidly acquire customers because the fundamental economics of the business makes sense. Where it doesn't make sense is where people will raise money to cover the fact that they're not making money so they can artificially lower prices and you know, this is kind of the issue that Uber ran into or is running into is that the model is different because if they, th their whole concept was, we're going to lower the price, gain a lot of market share, and then we'll raise the price. But in a very real way, the price was a big part of why people wanted to use it. Yeah. If cabs are cheaper than Uber, then all of a sudden the entire fact that you had this market share only, it was price dependent. And so that's where it's the, it's the tricky balance of are we using this money to speed up an acquisition cycle where we have the LTV to CAC metrics that this makes sense and we just need to do more of it faster to get a certain you know size? Um, the other instance is when you're trying to gain market share, but doing it the right way rather than necessarily this Uber example I was giving. Um, the third piece with uh, raising money is that you get insane valuations. And so, cause like if I, let's say I wanna sell 0.1% of acquisition.com. If I said I was going to do that and I posted it on my Instagram and for some reason the SEC said, yes, you can be a regulation A and I, I went through all the hoops, right? To do a public offering. I could probably get a billion dollar valuation for acquisition.com today because I sold so little and so many people wanted a piece and yeah. they're just betting on my brand that it's going to be worth that in the future, which is fundamentally what it is because you just have to do the math. It's like if I sold 0.1% at $10 million, then I would have a billion dollar company. So I think I could get $10 million from my audience right now to invest in acquisition.com if it's at 0.1%, probably. Because also, because most people aren't sophisticated, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. Point is, is that if you do it that way, at some point, someone gets hosed. Unless the company really does grow to a business that would, in, based on its actual profit, be worth a billion dollars. So theoretically, I could have, I could make, I could raise that money, 
And then I would grow into my valuation and have, let's say, a hundred million dollars in EBITDA, or you know, for people who know that is just fancy word for profit. Just leave it at that. Um, you know, five years from now. But the problem is, if my sales and my net profit goes up, people are going to bet that it's actually worth ten billion because they think it's going to keep going. And so that's the game. Um, and normally, those round, those fundraising rounds, kind of results in when that when there is the IPO for that company, the people who get hosed is the general public. It's the retail investor who basically does the catch up for all the investors they basically take out of their wallet um, for, for those people to be made whole, but now they have to grow into that valuation. And so those are kind of like some of the things thinking about with, with the right and wrong ways of doing it, et cetera. I have always been a no outside money guy. And I do that because I, I think you approach business a little differently because I think a lot of times people will raise money because it's an option. Yeah. And so I believe constraint drives innovation. And so I would rather say, okay, Let's say that that five hundred dollar to four thousand example. It's like okay, we've got uh, whatever that is an eight to one LTV to CAC ratio. Great. For those who don't know what that means, um, lifetime value of the customer compared to how much it co- the cost to acquire them. So I just you, you want a good CAC ratio in LTV life. to CAC, yeah. yeah. And so um, if we have that, if we have that uh, eight to one ratio, right? I would think okay, if it costs five hundred dollars, is there a way that I can say can I add a, an onboarding fee or can I add a sign up fee or can I add some sort of uh, front end value add product or service that can liquidate my acquisition costs so that I can be net zero on day one or day 30, where I can get a short term credit line to acquire the customer that's revolving rather than dilute myself in equity. And so I think it's like, I, I like trying to solve the problem rather than saying, cool, that's the, that's the equation. Let's go. Um, I just, I, I have a fundamental belief about the world that like, if you ask the right questions, you can solve the problem. And yeah. so that's why I don't, I don't raise. Um, and I just believe that we can, fu- if we're, if we're creative enough, we can figure out a way to make it grow profitably. I, I guess is, do people ever give you of like, you don't, you're not about raising money, but your company is about, you want people to want to raise money. It's not really, most of the times they're not raising money. Um, like not in the formal sense. Cause most of the times the, the, I mean, more than half of the deals we have, we put no money in uh, because we're like I, a strategic yeah, exactly. So that's kind of what I was saying earlier with the strategic partner. It's like, well, if I can 10x your business, then what is that worth to you? Yeah. Is it is it worth you know giving up a, a third to have a 10 times bigger thing? So you are now seven times wealthier than you were at the beginning. Everybody wins. Do I'm you, a big like expand the pie guy. Do you think a lot of people uh, assume there's some sort of number that every business has to get to before? Like, let's say people are building a business to get acquired. Is it, do you think like, hey, I need to get to 10 million. Hey, I need to get to 50 million. Hey, I need to get to 100 or... Like, what is your perspective on how companies view, like, I want to see this company have success. So they need to get to this certain number, or I want to, I see the the trajectory that I could be on. I want to acquire it before it gets so big that their, that their uh, value is significantly higher. Like, what do you, how do you think people from whose that? perspective, I guess both like okay. a, of a, a business owner, like how much money do I need to build it to? Mm-hmm. Um, or is it just like, just build a great company and worry less about how fast you're going to get to a hundred million, yeah. we'll call it. And from a business perspective, like how do you think that they analyze businesses to acquire? Yeah. So I'll start with the founder one. So founder wise, you know, I would say that the big thing that we always try and find is missionaries, not mercenaries. And so it's people who are really passionate about the cause because somebody who's passionate about the cause will always build a bigger company because they're doing it for the reason, for a different reason. And so it's like the person who loves walking walks further than the person who loves the destination. And so when people are trying to build a business in order to sell it, they tend to just have a different energy about going. It's everything. It just inherently is shorter. Yeah. Right. But if you have an unlimited time horizon, then there is no such thing as a rush and you can make the right calls for the long. Right. And that's what we really want. Cause you'll get the highest returns with somebody you can think five, 10 years out, but it just won't make sense for one year or two years, but like they can make a huge move. That's going to make it worth a ton. But if they're always obsessed about like, that's why public companies, it's like quarterly earnings calls. Like they have to think short term because CEOs are incentivized, blah, blah, blah. I won't even get into that. But from a founder perspective, um, we prefer long-term thinkers in terms of them getting acquired. I think the line is just at what point do you get institutional money? So institutional money would be like private equity money and up. And normally that doesn't really happen below 10 million in sales. Most of the time, um, I'm excluding tech for like seed and VC and all that. This is a different game than like what I would consider traditional business, which is what we're in, um, which is there's like, <laughs> like there's, you know, there's a lot of caveats to this. Uh, like with what I was saying earlier with fundraising that tends to happen more in tech companies. You know what I mean? And sometimes like open AI raised a ton of money to build artificial intelligence. Did that make sense? Absolutely. Did they have any way of making money until it started to work? No. 
still made sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's it, trying to keep it within context. Most businesses that are what I consider normal businesses that don't have a million X p- possibility, um, oftentimes can solve their problems if they just think about it a little bit harder. But back to the founder. So founder with institutional, usually 10 million in top line sales is minimum that they're going to really be interested in. You know, a million in EBITDA, maybe, but like if I'm going to go to market, I don't really want to take anything to market below five, like in EBITDA, in profit per year. Yeah. That's because that, that's when you can, you can get what I would consider real money. You know what I mean? Um, you know, you can get a 50, you can get a hundred, like that's, that's a, a meaningful enough size. And it's like, if, if you got to 10 or, you know, or if you're at 7 million and you've got one and a half million in profit, it's like, dude, we just, let's just, let's just get to 20 and have five. And now this is a company that becomes very acquirable. Okay. And at a bigger multiple with, with, uh, you know, you're talking about all these different like acquisitions things and how you're saying, you know, you could raise money from your, your audience. Yeah. Speaking of your audience, how did you get so popular on the internet (laughs) and why aren't you verified on Instagram? (laughs) Are you pissed about that? Um, I mean, you know, you gotta be a little pissed. Zuck, (laughs) Zuck, you know, help help a brother out. Um, no, I actually feel bad about it because there's like a hundred zillion like fake Hormozy accounts that are like, hey, invest in my thing. And so all these people uh, get like scam fraud and then I'll get a message like, dude, you took my hundred dollars. I get, I get caught my YouTube videos. They'll get like a, yeah, hey, congrats, WhatsApp. Send, yeah, yeah. send me yeah. 20 bucks and I'll send you a PlayStation 5. And people DM me like, is this you? I'm like, guys, yeah. like, what do you, come on. Like, yeah. As if you have to ask, you already know. <laughs> um, so anyways, um, in terms of the the rise, a lot of it was because of the team. So, I mean, the team that's off to the side here that you can't see. Um, you got Caleb, you got Quinn, you got the boys with a Z, um, who really who really uh, packaged you know me well and make me look cooler than I am. Uh, and so that's my goal every day. <laughs> it's me too. Um, and so it was really just you know applying the same things that we did with business just to kind of media. And media is very new to us. I mean, I've we've really only been doing it hard for I would say a year. Um, we started doing it in general. Like I started posting like two or three uh, YouTube videos a week of just me like screen recording myself. Yeah. uh, I think in September of 20. So it's been two ish years um, right now. And so, but anyways, taking it more seriously and actually doing like shorts and stuff we did about it a year and change ago is when we started doing that stuff. And that started growing. I think a lot of it is because there wasn't a lot of people doing it. We got into the right time. Um, you know, we've been, we've been we've been very lucky in a lot of things like that. I got into Facebook advertising in 2013, you know, with with the gyms and the fitness businesses. So like I was super early on that. I've just I've had a lot of things that just like it worked out that I got right. in early and we got a disproportionate return. Um but I mean honestly, I think if I were to give you a real answer, I I don't know. You know, I think I think there's a little bit of a vacuum for what I would consider real business education. Um because most of the people that are teaching business don't have very big businesses and the people with very big businesses don't make content. And I yeah. think that's, so I think it's just, it's a crisscross of those two things, which is a, uh, a very understandable story of legitimacy. Um, and then the, the quote advice, you know, that we, that I, you know, put out there is, um, is stuff that people actually, I get DMs all the time. They're like, dude, I ran that promotion that you said, I just made 50 grand like all the time. Like, dude, I, I, I changed your sales process and we tripled our sales. So people are actually using it, seeing the result. And then they become true believers. Cause they're like, dude, this is better than all the stuff I've paid for. And that's the goal. You know, I just want to, again, like my selfish intent here is that there's a kid who's 20 right now, consumes all my stuff. And in four years is doing 10 million a year. And it's like, dude, you've been on my vision board. I want acquisition.com as a partner. Let's make it happen. Like that's why I do it. But it's a long game. Was it, uh, you know, although you have a similar beard, (laughs) slightly almost as jacked as the liver king, you know, he had a strategy of like, I'm going to become popular on the internet. Like it came out, right? Well, I'm 50 pounds heavier than the liver king. Are you? Yeah. You look jacked, man. You're like a lump. (laughs) Let the record show. (laughs) Um, And you don't eat testicles, man. Yeah. Ball free since 03. (laughs) Well, there was that one time when when I went to Omnia. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Would, uh, like, was, was there a point when you were like, I want to become, I want to become a, a thing on the internet. Cause you uh, said it was like two years. hundred like, percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it was actually, it was, it was like a series of, so I'll give you the, I'll give you the long real answer, which was, I really wanted to be rich and anonymous. And there's like one video that Caleb was found of me being like, fuck content, <laughs> like all this stuff's <laughs> stupid. Like I just want to be rich and have no one bother me. Yeah. Um, and I did that for a really long time. And then what happened was like the thing that was like the first big crack is like anybody who's listening to this and thinks this is ridiculous. But when Kylie Jenner hit the, the front of Forbes and she was like 20 and a billionaire, I honestly, I was like depressed for a day. 
Like I really was like, <laughs> I think the world was depressed. I was like, why do I suck? Yeah, like, why no, yeah. am I insufficient? But I was like, you know what? Chris Jenner organized her whole life. Chris Jenner's the G. She's the one who's really older. Like she's just a figurehead for like Chris's empire. She's, a, she's also more attractive than you. Oh yeah. Right. If I, <laughs> if I had her, butt, I wouldn't even be here. Right. Um, <laughs> anyways, so that happened, but I like, you know, my ego is like, no, it's just Chris. And then it was organized. Okay, cool. And then Conor McGregor came out with uh, Proper 12 and it was like, boom, 600 million. I was like, shit. He did 600 million with that? Well, the company's worth 600, yeah. Oh. Um, and then and then Huda Beauty, she sold a portion of her company for, at 600 million. Just a YouTuber I don't and an Instagram. Know is. I know. And then, uh, and then again, I was like, this is like, this is starting to become a, a theme. And then The Rock had Terramana and then now they're worth like two to four billion. And so this just, kept, again, and it was like these chinks in, in my armor of like, you know, all this, fame stuff, stupid. Like, why would you want to be famous? You should, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so, um, finally I was at a, a buddy of mine's house. He's, he's very famous. Um, who is he? And I don't want to name drop him. Um, <laughs> he's very famous. <laughs> well, I just, you know, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to blow him up. Um, That's right. and, and it's Barack Obama. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. His friends call him bar. Um, and so, okay. Anyways. Uh, so I was there and he's like, and I was like, don't you get tired of like the, the weird messages and like letters at your door and people dropping off, like threatening your family and kids and stuff. Like, isn't that like, I was like, that sounds horrible. Yeah. And he said, if that's the price I have to pay for the impact I want to have, I'd make that trade every day of the week. And I just like, it just like stabbed me. And I was like, here I am saying that I like want to help people out and make products and services that, you know, serve communities and whatnot. And I was like, and I'm just too much of a pussy to like, get out there. You were doing like, a disservice by yeah. not producing content. Right. And that's exactly that. That was like the, and so at, after that point I was like, all right, we're doing it. And so, you know, I, I, I got a couple of vendors to, to new different platforms. Uh, Cause I just started with agencies. So I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And they were like, just send us three videos a week. I was like, okay. And then that was what started it. And then, um, you know, we started recruiting, bring people in house and now, you know, our in-house team is bigger than our, our vendor team. Um, but yeah, so we just start, you know, just started pulling the thread and start getting a little bit better and just try to add new platforms, you know, every, every few months and learn how this whole game works. And there's a strategy to become popular on the internet. Yeah. More good content. Mm, I've been doing it wrong for like 10 years, man. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, no, it's, so it's like, actually, so for anybody who is trying to do this, it's quantity first. So you just have to put out a lot of stuff and you do a lot of stuff, not because you're going to get a lot of reach from it, but because you don't know what you're doing. And so it tells you, it gives you two things. One is it gives you feedback from the audience because there's gonna be some stuff that does better than others. And so yeah. it's like, cool, do more of that. And then flip side, you'll also start to kind of like learn your voice. Because if you listen to some of my older videos, I sound just different, just less articulate, you know, whatever. I just, I wasn't doing this as much. And so um, quantity first, and then you start to learn how to increase the quality. That's like doing the more of that good stuff. So you start getting, you're like, oh, why did that video do well? Oh, is that a topic thing? Or did I have a good hook? Like whatever. You start studying the things that are outliers that do a little bit better. And then you really start focusing on quantity. So quality kind of drops a little bit and then you start quantity kind of drops and you just start focusing on like, if I put out one really good video, it does way better than 10 shitty videos. And so you're like, I'm going to do more of that. And I think the third phase is quality quantity, where you can put out amazing videos and then more of them or, you know, whatever your version of content is, podcast, et cetera. And so um, that's kind of how I see the, some of the phases playing out. And so right now we're right at the, I'd say cusp into the co condensing down into more quality because we've just been boom quantity to learn what the market wants. You know, I always want to talk about like LTV to CAC, you know, ratios and like churn ratios and like just different ways of like onboarding customers to increase LTV yeah. and like no one cares. So I was like, huh. But if I'm like, hey, I care. Uh, I care. Yeah. It depends on the audience. You know what I mean? Um, and so we, we actually alternate content. I mean, if we were, um, we're going into it. So we'll alternate content where it's like, there's, there's top of funnel content, which is content that we think will just reach a lot of people. And so that will, like, if I make something about Chipotle, which is referenced at the beginning of the show. Delicious. Right. It got you. Right. And so you might be, you know, it'll attract everybody, which means the net will also include bigger business owners because it includes everyone. But then to earn trust with that person, that's where the track, you know, the track record, et cetera, helps like having the, you know, the companies that we have and the exits and whatnot. Um, but then we have deep content that doesn't get the same amount of reach as kind of like the more general content, but then those people get to have, in my opinion, just like a deeper relationship. That's my running theory. I could be completely wrong. So but that's how we see what it. I got from that is Chipotle is the reason for your success. Yes. The common, the common thing among, among the people. Yes. And it's you chorizo <laughs> it is delicious. You made a comment about uh, like, uh, I don't want to call them like fake gurus or fake business people, yeah. but I'm sure that was probably frustrating of seeing, seeing popular people on the internet who you were like, well, something's not right there. Do you ever get people that think you're a fake guru? Yeah. 
it doesn't, I don't, I honestly don't think much about it, but yeah, I'm was, sure there are people who I are. I was doing a little deep dive and first of all, I've learned to never go into Reddit forums just <laughs> in your life, right? Cause the, it's yeah. the dark side of the internet and some comments that I was seeing, which, which again is that, cause I was doing research about you, right? Is that people were like, there's no way that this man is just giving out information for free. There's some ulterior <laughs> motive, right? Yeah, no. And I think someone said what you, some of your, your books are super cheap 99 or cents. and and they were like, it's a strategy, which it might be, but like, yeah. what do you say to people who are being like, there's no way he would just give all this information. I'm He's super, trying to suck us for money. I'm super transparent about my intention. I'm here to absolutely make money, but I just don't need most people's money. So if I have one Facebook investment, I make more than I would sell than I would if I sold coaching and programs and, and courses and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't need to. Cause like I said, if I make one, uh, you know, like we have 16 companies in the portfolio right now. Like most of them, I could probably like my equity stake is probably worth, I don't know, five, 10 ish million. Um, just as a conservative medium, how many, you know, how many thousand dollar courses do I have to sell to do that? A lot. Yeah. And in terms of a brand that I want to build, I don't want to do what everyone else does. So why would I want to, you know, I don't want to live their life. And to be fair, like most of the, like there's a cap to how much money you can make if that's the game. Like you can't get, in my opinion, you're not going to get like ultra wealthy. So for me to get to a billion, I'm not going to get there selling courses. Yeah. So I have to, I have to own something or stuff that's worth a billion. And so I have to play the game differently. So for people who are like, you know, he's trying to suck us for money. I'm probably not trying to suck that person for money because the type of person that I'm going after yeah. understands exactly what I'm doing. Um, so they have nothing to fear. Um, but no, I mean, we have, I have books. And the reason I had the book, it's 99 cents. And you know, it's crazy. I, it's like so many people from like Bangladesh and like Pakistan, like people who really like, they can buy the book and they're like, I get all these thank you messages, which is cool. Um, but I also think it's like part of the reason I'm doing this way is because like, I kind of want to prove a point, which is that you don't have, like, you don't have to play the game the same way. Like, if, and I just have this big belief that if you give the most away in the marketplace, you get the most over a long enough time horizon, you get the most back. And so everyone gets a little bit of goodwill and they try to monetize a little bit of goodwill, they monetize, right? But if you can just deposit and deposit and deposit and people are like, I don't know, when is the other, when is, when is the other shoe going to drop? And yeah. then, and then, and then you just keep proving it wrong. Then that doubter, that person actually ends up becoming your biggest fan. Like they become your biggest supporter. I think people just want to assume that everyone has some evil intent or I'm here to make money. They're yeah. like, I'm very, well, yeah. A lot of people that'd be like saying like, God, Apple only comes out with new iPhones to make more money. It's like, no shit. <laughs> it's like, of course. <laughs> yeah. And um, like, what do you, what do you think about, we'll call them fake gurus, like, or people that are uh, trying to sell the people who sell, sell courses about how to build a business, but their only business experience is make, a making a course to, about, how to, about yeah. how to build a business. Yeah. So I think, so this is a really, um, it's an, I have, I have a, I have a lot of thoughts about this. Um, because I, I have really strong views about the formal education system. I believe that there's the supply and demand of like the demand for income generating skills will not go away. That's only going to get more. Right. And the supply of people who could provide those skills in the formal education system was basic is basically nothing. And so they, their poor job, the fact that they never adapted, they skyrocketed the price, which is subsidized by the government so that no one could bankrupt themselves out of it, which created these insane uh, tuitions and, and no longer provided because they never changed. So it's the same education you got 50 years ago, but the markets changed dramatically. And so they just sell a really outdated product for an egregious price. And so the market continues to shift. So every, every year for the last three years, college enrollment has dropped and it's dropping faster every year because Gen Z is like, I like, don't think it's ROI. I'm just going to dance on TikTok now or whatever, <laughs> you know, or I'll start a business because now, yeah. cause like when I went to school, like YouTube wasn't a thing, you know what I mean? Instagram wasn't a thing. And so like the, the content that exists now wasn't there. And how old are you by the way? 33. Same Z's. There you go. Same age, same physique. It's great. Done. Um, and so, uh, this marketplace of alternative education sprouted from demand. People want to have these skills. And so a market will always appear where there's demand. And so people started providing that. I do think that we're in kind of still early days, big picture on alternative education, uh, because there will be illegitimate players and there will be legitimate players. Because if someone wants to learn a skill and someone says like, I want to learn how to sell and there's a sales school, what's wrong with that? The problem for the alternative education scene is that is the expectations that people set 
and the track record that they lie about. So I'll dive into both those real quick. So the expectations that are set is the primary issue that people don't have a problem with formal education and do have a problem with alternative education. So people spend $200,000 in four years and go into debt that they can't get out of because college promises nothing. They promise nothing. Yeah. They don't say you're guaranteed to get a job. They just say you'll have four years here. You might. That's it. Good luck. What we do guarantee is that if you get grades, we'll give you a diploma. That's yeah. the guarantee. And they fulfill that promise, which there's a whole nother conversation about expectation setting. On the other hand, a guy sells a thousand dollar course and promises that you're going to make $10,000 within 30 days. The course may be exceptional. It may teach a lot of skills, but if someone doesn't make $10,000 in 30 days, they hate the guy. Yeah. And so even though there may be in a very real way more value in that course than they do get in the, in the, the four-year education, and my wife's father is actually a former um, dean of engineering school uh, professor, and he said, and he's like bought some of the courses and he's like making money online now. And he's like, I would never tell someone to go to school anymore. He's like, I've learned so much more from these courses than I did from anything that we teach at school. And so like the, the, the game has shifted. And now also because YouTube has just blown up, a lot of really good stuff is available online for free. Yes. And so all that to say, uh, fake guru, in my opinion, just comes down to deception. So deception in terms of what you did to, to, to validate yourself, to say that you are an authority. So it's kind of like the example of like, I own a hundred million dollar business. And what it really means is like all of the customers that I've ever serviced over my entire life make a hundred million dollars. Yeah. And you're actually an agency that has 10 clients and one of them happens to be like, if, if someone, it's like, if my, if, if a vendor from, and this, this shit happens is a, a vendor of mine makes like one TikTok a month for me. And he's, and then he would say, I, you know, my clients make half a billion dollars with C then he's even still putting clients in, but some guys will go, you just drop the clients and be like, our, you know, our company is $500 million a year. Like that's a lie. Right. Yeah. And so it's really about the premise and the expectation that's being set. If someone says I was a sales guy at a company and I was a top 10% sales guy for five years, I can teach you how to sell. Um, that's a pretty straightforward, like, and he teaches somebody how to sell. And the way that he delivers that is a course and some sort of like, you know, call feedback and he reviews calls because, you know, maybe helps you get a job. Like that's a business and I, it's a demand. And the person wanted to get a sales job, which there is no good college career you know, path for sales. So the demand existed and the market created itself. I think a lot of the, the issues with it is that it, it, it's like the further it goes down the rabbit hole of it starts with good intent and then people teach people how they're going to like how to sell. And then now they're like, oh, I've learned everything from this course. Now I'm going to get some people to teach them what I learned from this person. And it just gets like, I don't want to say dumber and dumber, but it's like less. Diluted. Yeah, less from the authenticity of like yeah. the top of the funnel. Mm -hmm. It's interesting stuff. It's and that's and that's so it's either it's the deceit around expectations and it's the deceit around legitimacy. And I think those are the two core issues for why, like if those two problems were solved and like, let's just play it out a perfect scenario. If someone, you know, if Bob Iger from Disney, now Bob Iger from Disney doesn't need to sell a course because he, because he's rich enough on its own, on his own. But if Bob Iger wanted to sell a course on how to be CEO and said, I'm Bob Iger and I've been CEO of Disney. And I promise you that all I'm going to teach you is the lessons that I've learned. I don't think people would have an issue with it. Right. They would buy the course. They wouldn't buy the course, whatever. But like, he's not going to say, if you do this, you'll be CEO of a company. That's where he'd get in trouble. Right. So it's what's my legitimacy and what are the expectations that I'm setting for the customers? What promises am I, am I making and can I deliver on them? And so it's like, if we have these two things that are legit, here's why you should trust me and you're not lying or exaggerating. And then here's the expectation you should have and you're not lying or exaggerating. I think you're completely in the clear. But most people can't do that because it's so easy to just push it a little bit, just a little bit, and uh, and get way more people to buy and raise your price by a lot more and blah 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 blah. Yeah, no, I I completely agree with you. Do you do you well? Do you sell any courses on how to? No, no, it's all free on the site. You don't even have to opt in. You know, some things I look at is, and I guess some people want to have maybe uh, uh they they want to pay someone to have this specific like I paid, so I'm going to feel like I I need to follow mm -hmm. through with something. Mm -hmm. Because in my head, and maybe this is just how my brain works, I'm like, why would you pay someone if people who are building businesses like you, like maybe even a Gary V or something, yeah. they're literally putting out hours and hours and hours a week of content of what yeah. they're doing, how they do it, tips. And I'm like, mm -hmm. why wouldn't you just listen to these people? So people should do that. Um, but most people aren't that way. And so there's a couple things that like, I'm, you know, a tweet that went really viral of mine was um, give away the secrets, sell the implementation, right? And so- 
you know, you could make the same argument, like use all my stuff and get to a hundred million, which you can, right. But you also want personalization, which is like, does this apply to my company right now? Ah, okay. Well that requires nuance and I can't make personalized nuance in a video. Right. And so a lot of people think, and this is the crazy thing. People think that if they give away their secrets, they're not going to make money, but you're going to make more money if you give away your secrets. You're just afraid of it. Right. And so you sell the implementation. And so to your point, like fundamentally the entire fitness industry is based on selling accountability. Like stop eating and move more. Like it's not complicated, Mm -hmm. right? But the heart is in the execution. And so that's, so to your point, um, should people just execute? Sure. Do they? No. Demand market. And so they're like, I need help. I need someone to hold me accountable. I need someone to personalize it. If I get, if I have a plateau, someone who's done this with a hundred other people before me so that I can avoid the common pitfalls. And so that, that, promise exists in every industry. You want to implement a CRM? Sure. You can watch the CRM videos, but they're probably not perfect for you or your business right now. So you pay for implementation. You know, if you have, you know, a gardening thing, like you can teach people how to garden, but then some people are like, can you just do it for me? Sure. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. all of these things, um, there's always an opportunity. Like you can provide all the value upfront and people will still want help. And I think that that's a totally noble and fine business. You help people out who want it. You help everyone else for free. It's a win-win. With the angle of your like mass production production of content that is teaching people, was there a point like when you made the uh, the the idea to to become popular, you know, more popular than you, than you were at the time, to be public. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you have to make a shift in your? Because obviously, running a bunch of companies yeah. is completely different in the time it takes to running a bunch of companies, and now I need to be a public figure mm-hmm. and produce content and be active and all those things. How did that, how did that shift of balance of work happen? Or were you just like delegate this now? And now I'm, I'm a Instagrammer, YouTuber guy. Um, well, the team's great. So honestly, I get a ton of leverage from, from them. You still have to sit down for hours and whatnot to make Mm -hmm. all these videos. I I understand you're not editing them, but you know, to, to sit down or do this. Yeah. And yeah, you go on a lot of podcasts, which I'm like, a lot of people would maybe think of like, I'm an, I'm a business owner. Like I can't do anything how is this guy so successful? And he can go on two hour podcast every week. Yeah. I think the nature of work looks different. So I think the biggest misconception is like, there's, you know, there's, you know, people talk about like there's in the business, there's on the business, and then there's above the business. And so like the, the portfolio companies have CEOs, like they have people running, you know, the, their company day to day. And then, you know, at Holdco's acquisition.com, like Layla is actually the CEO. So Layla has a much harder time of balancing it than I do. Um, my job is more so get deal flow. Mm-hmm. Like that is, that's always been my hat in any business that we've owned is just make sure that we have people, the phones ringing and the people are knocking on the door. And so this is a way of doing that. So this is in some ways my primary responsibility. Um, but in, in terms of time right now, um, I would say probably one to one and a half days a week right now. And that's up from what it was last year. And so my goal is to do more of this. So I would like to continue to increase that percentage, which is different than like Gary. Gary's like, I'm running all day long and people are going to capture it. We're going to be more purposeful about uh, curated content. Like I'm going to, we're going to, we, we will put more time into our videos, into our shorts, into blog posts, into things like that. Um, and honestly, the big reason is because like, I actually like it. I yeah. enjoy it a lot. And so do, that's why we do more of it. Do the ideas that like all your videos of, you know, do this to make a thousand dollars a day, whatever yeah. is that, do you have like a notes in your phone of like, when you think I have cool ideas, and then when you go to film them, is it, I'm going to bang out 12 videos and change my shirt or not change my shirt or something? Or is it, I'm going to film one, have another idea. Or do you have like days where you do it or is it sporadic? Yeah. So how many video ideas do you have in your phone right now or in your brain? So my video, you can look at my video idea board. It's public. Uh, oh, it's really? my Twitter. Oh, okay. Okay. So Twitter is my, is my homepage. So that's like, it's so funny because some people are like, I thought you had a ghostwriter. It's like, that's me all day long. Just tweeting ideas of like things that I think are interesting or funny or whatever. And then the team grabs from that is like, I think this will be a banger video. I think this would be a great short. I think this would be a great whatever post. Um, and so all my, like my Instagram posts and the short videos come from Twitter. Mm. That's for me, that's my easy brain dump. Um, in terms of recording, uh, we've been doing every other week, uh, one day. And that's where we do a few longs and shorts. Like today is a recording day. So I was recording before this and I'll be recording after this. Um, Fridays are usually my day. And so that's how we do it now. Now I would like to get to, you know, once a week. So when I said a day and a half, part of that's like the mental headspace of like, okay, game planning, things like conversations I'm having around the media. Right. Um, And if you include the book, then it's even more than that. Cause the book takes probably a day and a half a week too. the book. 
Uh, so hundred million dollar offers is the, the, the book that, right. I, that I put out. Um, but I have a second book that's coming out after that hundred million dollar leads. Well, you had the gym, gym launch book and the hundred million dollar offer. So this is the third book. How Those have, books aren't related. How do you have so much time in the day, dude? You're a, you're a machine. Layla. Okay. Layla, like Layla, like Layla run shit. Like Layla, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a travesty. Um, if Layla were a guy and we were just business partners and not married, she would be more popular than I am by a mile. She just doesn't get the credit because she's a girl. Hmm. Why do you think that is? Because there aren't many girls who are successful. I mean, like if you look at the Forbes list of female billionaires, like the top girls, like, I don't know, 12 Kylie billion. Jenner. <laughs> no, she's not even close. Yeah. Um, the top girl is like an old lady who has a roofing company. What? Yeah. Um, but like to be on the top, on the Forbes on the top 100 self-made, self-made, because you can marry, you know, McKinsey Bezos is number one, you know, technically, whatever. But self-made uh, female entrepreneurs, to be on that list is 250 million. Mm. To be on the guys list of top 400, so four times as many. Like to get on the list, you got to be at like three billion. What? To, there's just not as many. And who, who know, you know, nature, nurture, whatever. But like Layla's a player. You're like Layla's a gangster. And the reason that my income you know, catapulted as soon as she and I hooked up. Um, it was her, you know what I mean? Like I had six gyms, but like I was, you know, I wasn't raking it in. you know, we made probably a few million bucks a year, top line, but not bottom line. You know what yeah. I mean? It's a, it's a low margin business. Um, and I know I'll tell you this. I never felt like I had money. Um, and then when she and I got together, it was like, she just, she was just willing to do whatever it took. Like I told her, um, I was like the number one thing that she's just fucking down. Like I was like, we're going to go and not sleep for a month and like walk on fire. She's like, all right, I'm in. Damn, you didn't, you didn't sleep for a month and you walked on fire. Yep. That's crazy. And man. she was down. <laughs> that's good. Like a, down. a ride or die, you know, a hundred percent. That's why in the first book, she's that's the, that's the thank you. Um, and she is my ride or die. So um, I think you got to find that person if you can, because most people marry people who are constantly making compromises with them of like, you can only work this much. You can only pursue this much of your dream. And either you create a super distant marriage where one person just resents the other and is like, whatever, um, or one, or they both compromise, you know? And, um, I've been fortunate that I have a partner who wants to do it just as much as I do. And so we get two times the output rather than half of my output or just one X of my output. Do you think that, uh, you know, and we're not going to live in like an alternate universe here, yeah. but do you think that if you found someone that wasn't as business savvy, focused, determined, driven as your current wife, mm -hmm. do you think it would have completely change you? Or do you think that you, you could, you could still do the things you do and maybe have someone who wants to live that casual second part of like the day, the life, the evening type of thing, rather than business focused? Like, do you think it's important for people who are trying to be that grind entrepreneur that they have to find this other half that's like them with the same business mindset? Yeah. I won't speak in half twos. Um, I can say for me, this now that I have this, I don't know how I would not have this. Yeah. Um, I had relationships in the past and I have all the love and respect for those people. Um, but the dynamic was much more kind of what you're saying, which is like, Hey, stop working. Let's go, you know, be social and do that. And I could definitely rationalize the fact that it's like, Hey, it's good to have some balance in my life and whatever. But like in some ways balance is silly. Cause like in a different saying it a different way, it's like, Hey, stop doing the thing you like the most and do something you like less that's balance. I'm like, why? Why don't I just do more of the thing I like more of? Like a lot of it is just taking external judgments on what we're supposed to do based on some arbitrary societal rule and projecting it on our lives and saying what we're doing is good or bad. And I just fundamentally reject that. Like we do what we want to do. And if we want to work for 30 days straight, then we work for 30 days straight. And if we want to take three days off. We take three days off. Like I just, it just is. So do you think that people uh, I think there's a lot of the mindset, especially with the whole, you know, like red pill stuff of like, you know, especially when you're trying to build. I'm not your, super build. familiar with that. Okay. Well, um, I, I guess the, the, the best phrase to say would be, especially when people are coming up, it'd be like, disregard women, acquire wealth. <laughs> acquire currency. You yeah. know, it's like um, that yeah. kind of mindset of yeah. like, I don't, I, I can't get a partner or like a significant mm -hmm. other um, until I get to this point. Or do you mm -hmm. think people can build something with it or, um, like how, how's your thought on people who maybe are single yeah. and want to build a business? Do you think they sh should only focus on themselves and, and not try to have that relationship balance or wait until they find the. Yeah. 
I won't, Layla. I won't should because I don't believe in shoulds, but um, I will say if you make more money sooner, you will attract more attractive women. That being said, they may be more attractive physically, but then if they came to you because you have money, then why do you think they're there? And so it really just depends on what kind of relationship you want to have. And so, you know, there's a reason that they have like the stories of like the pauper and the prince or what, you know, what, where the, the guy pretends like he doesn't have money to find a girl who actually likes him. Because I mean, it's great for Instagram to have the, the model next to you or whatever it is so that you can gain status from that. But like when you're alone at night and the person that's in bed with you, you like have no shared reality and everything that they believe about the world you hate. Is it worth it? That's some deep shit. For me, it's not. You know, uh, my just to give you a little insight on, on my my relationships. I've been I was single for seven eight years, um, and I was very transparent with that on YouTube. Yeah. And I was like the single guy for just it was like I was gonna be the single. I was gonna be the cool uncle. I was gonna be the cool, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, and I, you know, started building businesses and became, you know, on a relative, uh, very successful yeah. at what I'm doing. And when I found my current girlfriend, who were a year in, and it's mm-hmm. the best thing that's ever happened to me you know, we got a lot of, or I got a lot of, you know, this person's only with you now because you're successful. Sure. And I think a lot of people where you say, you know, Hey, build, you know, get to yourself, uh, get to a point where, you know, you're successful. And then the, the higher level of, mm-hmm. of women or partners like will, will be there. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people will just assume that when you get there, the only people that you're going to be able to find are people that are going to want you for your money. So I'll, I want to add up. It's like how do successful people yeah. find women? I want to, I, yeah, I want to put a really or important men. caveat. I think this is really good. You want somebody who's attracted to you because of your character, not because of your assets. And so if the character is the thing that created the assets and that's what they're attracted to, then if you lose the assets, they still love you. If they are attracted to you because of the assets and what those assets can do for them and you were just a part of that package, then that is something that I would run the other way from. But again, that's me. Some There are people that I know who have that relationship and from everything that I can see are very content and they, and they have clear expectations. They know that it's a transactional relationship. She, and this isn't guy, girl, you know, the guy where the guy's making it, uh, the girl knows that when, you know, daddy has to work, daddy's going to work. You know what I mean? And then she understands that her lifestyle is a result of the fact that he works and she's less demanding. Cause he says, I can't have you demanding. And if I'm here and we only see each other for two hours a week, and it's when we go to the pool thing and you have your girlfriends around, that's how he unplugs. I think it, it's really not about the shoulds. It's about like about what works for you. Uh, for me, I want, I want a partner who I can share my life with the battles, the scars, the things that we're going through. And for me, if I don't have somebody that I can share that with, I feel very alone and I don't like that. And so, or rather lonely. Um, and so I've been in relationships where I feel unbelievably lonely because I just feel like I'm the only person going through this. And so having her as my partner, we can have, we can have, we can, we can talk about business all day, which is what all I want to do anyways. And it's all she wants to do. Um, and it's great. You know what I mean? And again, this is just what works for me. Some people don't function that way and that's fine. You know what I mean? I would just say that if what you're currently doing is not working, consider an alternative. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And with building, building yourself up and building maybe to get to this point where again, you know, relationships and super happy in life. And you, you talked about the Forbes lists. Mm -hmm. Um, is there a number that you have in your head that, I mean, you're clearly someone who enjoys building, enjoys creating, enjoys the, the grind, right? Um, you know, whether you have internal, I'm proving myself, I can do this, I can get to this number. Is there like a number that will hit to that will, you know, satisfy you? Well, I'm satisfied playing the game. And so it's like the person who loves walking versus the person who loves the destination. I'm walking, so I'm good. And because of that, I'll probably keep walking. And so if I keep walking, we'll start, you know, knocking over milestones, but I'm walking because I like walking and the milestones just happen. The mile markers just continue as you just keep walking. So, you know, the, the tangent, you know, the, the hard goals are just milestones that you hit, but like, it doesn't matter. And, and you're not, well, it's, yeah, cause at a certain point, more money is not going to do anything for you. Right. Um, and you know, an interesting thing is always like, I want to create wealth for the next generation, the next generation. Yeah. And, uh, it, you're not so much of a tangible Bugatti, you know, <laughs> Lamborghini guy. I know you went through a phase where you, you sold everything. Yeah. I mean, I know you, you were, 
I watched a bunch of your videos and your mindset on how you spend your money is very interesting to me um, about, you know, the the place where you live rather than having a house where you had to, mm-hmm. you know, maintain the house and have all the cleaners yeah. and even your opinion on food. What is your, uh, like, why don't you feel like you want to have a fancy car, big fancy house? I don't know. Yeah. Do you have any fancy watches or anything? No. What's the dumbest thing you ever spent your, mo- spent your money on? A Bentley. How much was that? 350, I think. And then when you got it, were you like, this is sick or are you like, I hate myself? <laughs> it just, it, 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 it was nothing. Yeah. I was like, this is another car. You know what I mean? And it, it, it conferred no incre- incremental benefit to my life. So like I spend tons of money on gym equipment because yeah. I love gym equipment. You know what I mean? Like I loved, I have too much of it and I still want to buy more. Um, and it's fun. And it's one of the few things that I derive a lot of joy from in my life. Where do you put your gym equipment? It will be in our office that we're building. Okay. But I mean, before that it was in my house. I had a full commercial gym in my house. And you're big, uh, you spend your money on, I guess you could say experiences, but like food, like your take on food is very, mm-hmm. I, I, I could agree with a lot of it. Um, can you explain your- I only eat sour, sour candies. No. <laughs> Specifically sour strips, everyone. <laughs> That's been my diet the past couple of days. But your, um, I saw something on Instagram recently yeah. and it got, the comments made me want to like smash my face against the table because yeah. I feel like people take certain things for exactly the face value and sure. they're not like extrapolating it. Um, you said about like cooking food is dumb. Mm-hmm. Buy all your food. What do, explain that? Yeah, I mean, the, it's just opportunity cost. So, like, if you are, if you are, some, and I said, if you are, if you're making fifteen dollars an hour or more, uh, then the amount of time that it costs, at least for me, when I went to the grocery store, like I made my list, checked it twice, went to Costco, bought all the food, came back, unpacked it, prepped it, cooked it, boxed it, put it in the fridge, and then every time I would eat it, I would take it out. I would eat the food. I would clean my dishes. Like all of that cost me more time than just working that period and then eating out. Like the incremental cost difference as a single guy with families, it's a little bit, but as a single guy, if you only need to make for one, oftentimes you have to cook twice anyways. Cause like by the sixth day, the chicken starts looking weird. Yeah. It just starts spreading a third, third leg. And you're like, what the fuck is the top of my Tupperware container? Yeah, there's an eyeball growing in there. And so, so now it's like, now I'm cooking twice a week. Right. And so when I started adding up the math, I was like, the math didn't pencil out. And to be fair, I made more than $15 an hour. And so for me, I was, I've, I've been selling since I've been an entrepreneur. And so I knew that if I just worked my leads for a day, I would make an extra grand. So there was just, there was never, it just never made sense. Um, and so my, the, the message of that is do the math. Like if you make $2 an hour, by all means, you know, go like, go, go to the grocery, you know, do, do all that stuff. But if you, if you make just pencil out how, how long it actually costs you in all the costs, clean prep, cook, cro- grocery shop, plant, all of that cost for most people, it's like 10 hours a week. Yeah. 10 hours a week. I'm like, that's a, that's a quarter of a work week. If I had a quarter to my income, and then how much is the incremental cost compared to the groceries, that delta? Is it more than 25% of my income? That's probably the easiest equation. If it's more than 25% of my income, that, that delta, then I shouldn't, I shouldn't do it. Is that, is that how your brain works whenever you go to like yes. do anything? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was like, do you want to swing into Chipotle? Be like, well, I did the math on uh, how long it would take to sit in that line over there. And I believe that that McDonald's would uh, give me more valuable time if I go through that. <laughs> it's yeah. getting cheaper. Is that how your like brain works? Yeah, 100%. I want, I want to hear with, uh, with optimizing your time and optimizing efficiency, yeah. I want to dive a little bit into AI because that's going to change the world. And yeah. I watched your video and Frightening. what is, why are you so bullish on AI? I mean, I don't think we're going to stop AI. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, I don't, I, the only, so interesting, I think, um, so th- there's two, th- it's like, I don't even know if government intervention could stop AI. Like it's just the wheels of progress don't stop turning. They never have in the history of humanity, to my knowledge, like they don't really stop turning unless it's super niche and there's tons of money that can squash a tiny invention, like a a light bulb that lasts forever. And then like Philips and all the other companies like buy the company and then don't produce the product because it cuts into their margins or whatever. Um, But this it's already too big in my opinion. And the wealth that can be generated from AI is too large for any person to stop. Um, And very transparently, I'm very afraid of it. Um, because every other innovation to this point has been around a specific improvement in human productivity. So the industrial revolution, you know, revolution, the agricultural revolution, like these are all improvements in how we did things and we became more productive and the people just moved up a level in productivity. This is an invention that can undermine the human institution. 
Because if a robot can human better than humans can, then what is left for humans to do? I'm scared of AI too, because I've seen iRobot and I know what happens in that fucking movie. Yeah, man. exactly. It's just you and a dog. And so, <laughs> which is not a bad life, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I think that there may, in, in a very weird way, you might actually see people moving out of really developed countries into undeveloped countries because they don't have AI and they might be like back to normal. That's like a weird, like potential prediction I'll throw out there. Um, Some black mirror shit. Yeah, you might see people move into Africa because like AI hasn't taken over yet. Do you, the, well, I think one of, I mean, there's a lot of uh, people's opinions yeah. on that. Uh, one of the large ones I would say is like, you know, the the South Park, like they took her jobs, you know, like they're taking the jobs of the people. And what's interesting is people really want to fight it because, you know, we want to get, I understand yeah. like we want to give jobs to people, but then they're, when they go to the grocery store, they, they hate standing in the line for the one checkout person, but they're like, they love the self checkout because it's so fast. Like they're starting to be like, well, that's okay because it's really fast for me to get in and out of my groceries. But like it, it like when it affects them in a certain way, they allow it or like don't mind it. Yeah. But but they hate how you know at McDonald's instead of needing a person to take your order, yeah. you can just tap on the machine. Mm -hmm. So this is this is a clear example of the tragedy of the commons. So like global warming, that whole thing is tragedy of the commons. So everybody has to agree that we're all going to long-term do this thing. And if we don't, and any player can individually like benefit themselves, but players will benefit themselves. Right. And so the example you gave with McDonald's, it's like no one, like most people don't want global warming. Most people don't want uh, AI to take their job, but they're okay with it taking someone else's job. And the thing is, is that we're going to vote with our dollars in the way that's most convenient for us. And so we will vote locally for the things that's convenient for us, but in so doing, invest globally in the thing that will put us out of business. And so, um, I for that reason, I don't think it it will be stopped because you said I think people are going to vote with their dollars that they're fine with an AI checkout person and they're going to have a, a an entirely automated Starbucks. Like I think that they will vote that way because they'll get cheaper coffee, they'll get it faster, and they won't mess up the order. I think it ju it just shifts, you know, instead of the people working. Yeah. You know that the, the, the machines replaced now they will need people to build the machines or make the machines until they have machines that make the machines, mm -hmm. but then they'll need machines to build those machines that build the machines. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you think it's like, when do you think it'll stop in terms of the, the cutting? Like, I guess, I guess like what is the future for the jobs for basic entry level jobs when machines and AI can do all of the things for you? The chat, GPT. GPT. Yeah. It's like things like that of write, write a website, write a code, mm -hmm. create a, you know, thing of, you know, where is the shift of where jobs you think are secure? Because people need to get there. We'll go there. I've stumped them. I've stumped them, everyone. I don't know. Because again, as soon as AI can human better than a human can, it's tough. Like right now, the knowledge-based skills are going to go first, which is reverse of what people thought. They expected it to be blue collar. Like if you had asked people two years ago, what's AI going to fix first? They're going to be like, well, all the low skilled jobs, all the labor, that's going to get replaced first. And then it'll be the slightly lower skilled white collar jobs. And then the higher skilled white collar jobs like programmers and things like that. And then finally, maybe the creatives. But it's been the exact opposite of that. It started with the most creative things like making images and paintings and and pictures and and essays and words. Like most of human communication in a creative venue, like it can do that first. And robotics is already there in terms of being able to do better than what a human can. It just hasn't become cost efficient, but we know on any time horizon that technology becomes more efficient over time. And when that AI brain meets this robot body, it can now do what humans can do in the real world. Um, and so like, where do humans go? That's fundamentally the issue. They've have a four and a half year UBI study that's being undertaken by open AI because they, I'm pretty sure know what's going to happen, which is that Many, many, and like, even if there are, like, to your point, like, even if there are jobs that like some humans can do, most humans can't. And so like chat GBT writes better than like 60% of Americans. In 15 seconds as well. It's right. And that's today. The question is what chat GBT 100 can do. Maybe it writes better than all humans. Because th there's something called the drift, which is right now AI is learning from humans, right? It's learning from the stuff we do and it's mimicking that. But in a future iteration, it will learn from itself. It'll, it'll be AI learning from AI. And then at that point, it starts to drift away from what we know to what is purely AI generated. Um, and I mean, I've been very transparent. Like I'm, 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 very, I'm, I'm very worried 
about what will happen for the vast majority of people. Um, you know, I'm a competitive person. We absolutely have embraced AI within our company and it's because we don't have a choice as far as I see it. You know, I, Elon has far more clout than I do and he lobbied with the government for years to get AI regulated and they refused to hear him out at all. Um, and the thing is, even if the US regulated it, China won't. And we need to stay competitive because if they use that against us, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, so it's tough. It's tough. It's super tough. And, you know, like what about education and, and things in schools? Like, you know, they're like, no school uh, technology can use chat GPT. It's like, yeah, the kids don't have phones. That's like saying, uh, everyone don't use your TI 83s to cheat on this, uh, essay. And you're like, that's fine. I'm going to my notes right now. And yeah. I got all the formulas written out. Yeah. So it's, it's, it has really profound implications. And I think humans are really bad at predicting things. That's what I can say. Like the fact that AI two years ago, people would have said blue collar jobs and it's literally the last thing that's being replaced just shows you how bad we are predicting. Yeah. So my predictions are weary at best to go. I hope it ushers in a golden era for humanity. I hope more than anything, we, we, you know, we, we, we do nuclear, nuclear fusion and we, you know, we cure all diseases and we can reverse aging. Like, I hope we can figure all that stuff out. But if you can get your logo designed in five seconds and get 10 different versions, who gets fired? Yeah. And get the al designer. alternate, alternate versions, alternate colors yeah. in a millisecond. Yeah. In the short term, and I said this in the video, the short term, the people who are going to do quality assurance on the stuff that chat GPT spits out will be the opportunity. They'll actually be having outsized opportunity. So like, if you know how to write code, then what happens is now you can write 10 times the code. So the execution has been delegated, but you still have to think is you validate that the code is correct or is good or does the job that it needs to. If like it can write code, if I were to ask it to write code, I don't know how to read code. So it doesn't matter that it can write code for me because I don't know how to judge it. So I still need a human to do that. And that human can now check 10 times as much code or hundred times as much code, which means the value of an expert increases in the short term. Long term, once the AI can check itself and can do it better than a human can, it can check millions of lines of code. Outside of business related things, just to go a little nerdy or deep on that. <laughs> okay. Neuralink. Yeah. Are you, what do you think the future of you know, we have essentially what like Petri dish babies now. I, sure. I can choose the, the eye color, the hair color, uh -huh. what gender they're going to be. Yeah. Um, and with the Neuralink, we might be able to, I, was it you that was watching a video that was, you know, some people can do certain tasks and with Neuralink, maybe everyone can have these uh, mm -hmm. attributes to them. You know, there are some people with photographic memory. Now, what if everyone has access to photographic memory yeah. and everyone becomes superhumans? What do you think of the future race if everyone's just perfect? I mean, they'd, it's be, be, better, sick, they'd be better than the current race. Damn. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, survival of the fittest means the survival of the most adaptable. And so if you have a, you know, if you go from bio flesh that can get diseased, it can get hurt, it can, it ages, it decays, I hate it. right? And you have a robot that's, you know, a hundred times as strong, can upgrade itself. You can like, no one gets old because you literally can just upgrade yourself as you're going. Um, I know we're, we're bordering into, you know, science fiction here, but Point is, in our lifetimes, some of this stuff is possible, you know? And if AI can start innovating on its own, then there was a futurist who said like, AI will be the last invention humanity ever needs to make because then it will make all innovations after that faster, better, stronger than we can. And if the future race is a merge between humans and AI and cyborg, then that would be interesting. The question is why they would need us. Robots are gonna take over. It's, it's an That's interesting take, but, but I... I, w I will say though, I, yeah. I disagree that robots like how like strong they can be. Cause I mean, I can deadlift 650 pounds. And there's no way a robot's going to be stronger than me. Period. <laughs> With the whole AI thing. <laughs> Look, I, I do a lot of dumb jokes here. <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> Just see cranes, man. <laughs> With AI, the whole idea is that you're offloading tasks you don't need to do yeah. back to kind of business, what is, what is your, a lot of people, you always hear about outsource, outsource, delegate, yeah. delegate. When do you think people need to get to the point where they are doing it? Like, like what are things that people shouldn't let go of and things that people should let go of immediately that generally yeah. they hold on too long? So again, I won't say shouldn't, shouldn't, but I would say if you're optimizing towards making the most money, then you have to trade up uh, in higher leverage activities. So it's, what do I, so leverage is just defined as the difference between inputs and outputs in a system. So if I do this, then I get this output. And so the leverage is the discrepancy between that. So if I have a one to one ratio, I have low leverage. If I have a one to 10 ratio, I have higher leverage, right? And so um, 
when we are leveling up as entrepreneurs, we need to trade out the things that we get one to two on and trade in things that we get one to 20 on. And you just keep trading the whole way up and you just keep going. And that's the kind of unending infinite game of business. What do you think is like the number one thing that people shouldn't delegate? Like when you start a company, right? Yeah. You have a passion behind it. There's still something like, what's the, what's the point you get to when you're just like, it's, you're not even, you just collect a check and you don't even like live in the world of that business anymore. Like, do you think everyone should get to that? Or like even with acquisition.com or some yeah. of your stuff, like, do you think there would be a point where you're like, I don't literally do anything. I just own it. Yeah. I don't need to look at it ever. Like, is, do, do you lose the interest and the passion for it when it gets to that point though? Well, if you get to that point, then you're probably inherently disinterested. So if you like, so again, I won't do shoulds. If you, if you like doing something, then by all means do it. If you're optimizing for how much money can I make, then it's theoretically, if you can get someone to do the same thing that you're doing and do it for less than a hundred percent of your equity, then you trade up. Look, and if you sense. get lots of people to do that, then you make more money. So the idea is to actually is solve for zero. So if you solve for no time, no energy, then you have infinite leverage on that thing. And so if you have lots of zeros, then you have all your time and you have checks that are coming in. In terms of like life fulfillment, that's a totally different question. Um, but if you have no commitments and you have cash flow that's going in, then if you want to, you could pursue the next business, you know, if that's what you were interested in, or if you like painting or whatever, you know what I mean? Um, so what are the things that people shouldn't outsource? Nothing. You should be able to, you know, you can outsource whatever you want. I think it's just what goals, you know, what goals do you have? If you love painting and your whole business is painting, as soon as you hire painters, you're no longer painting anymore. Is that what you wanted? Yeah. Some people, yes. Yeah, some people know. Because the difference is if a painter wants to make money painting, that is different than somebody wanting to start a painting business. And so one is a business career. The other is a technician career. And a lot of people, and that's actually a really big one. A lot of people who are technicians love the craft and hate the business. And they need to decide whether they want to be business people or they want to be technicians. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. They just need to decide for themselves and then stop their expectations about having both. Because the businessman wishes he could paint all day. The painter wishes he could make the money of the businessman. You know, and, a, a relative thing of, of that is uh, I have a buddy who is a, a leather crafter, I guess you will. He yeah. makes leather, leather goods. My, my wallet is made by him, right? And um, we've done a lot of collabs and he has to make them in this high quantity. He's physically doing everything to make the, these wallets. And at some point he's like, oh, like there's X crazy amount of hours in here and I can't create out, but, but, but he wants to continue to grow the business. I'm like, well, well, bro, like, why don't you just hire people to yeah. make the wallets with you or to do it? And he's like, well, then I'm not going to be, it's not going to be like handmade by me. And then, mm -hmm. you know, he wanted to um, create duffel bags, but he's like, I can't create these. And he outsourced them, yeah. you know, and it, it starts losing touch, but he's so like obsessed with him needing to like make the wallets. Yeah. But I'm like, are you trying to, make wallets or build a business. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. And, and, and having passion in your work, I would you, would you say that most people should find a business that they're passionate about? I don't think people should or shouldn't do anything. I think they, like, he hates the want, word should. No, I don't like should. Um, I think people can, if they, if they want to make more money, then you optimize for the vehicle that will make you the most money. And then you do that. The, the whole passion piece teases out the psychology of humans. Because if you're just looking at first principles of like, what has to happen? Like build the business that has the highest leverage, that has the highest total adjustable market, that has highest potential gross profit per customer and do that. That's what you would need to do if you wanted to make the most money. If you're, but if you, as soon as you add in the psychology of humans, it's like, when do you get tired of this? When do you lose interest in it? And so the big thing for me, at least, is that I love business. And so as long as I'm doing business, I'm good. And so the nature of the business doesn't matter as much. And I would say a lot of entrepreneurs are that way. Um, and so the big, the big decision is, do I want to be a technician or do I want to be an entrepreneur? And they are very different paths. And I just don't, it's very difficult to have both. Like if your buddy, like he needs to make that decision of like, okay, I have more demand for my wallets than I can fulfill. So he has two options. He can hire and train other people or buy a machine that can do the same quality thing as he can. And he becomes a business owner of a wallet or leather company. Or he raises the price of his wallets because he has more demand than he has time. And so over time, his business does grow, but based on quality and based on the fact that it's handmade and it's, you know, blah, 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 and his special, his special touch and he kisses it and he sings it's on, you know, sleep every night. 
And so, but like, that's the, that if he wants to keep making wallets and he wants to keep making money, he will have to do that. And his profits are actually going to go up. He's probably not going to build a billion dollar wallet company, but he could make a few million dollars a year. So it's just like, what does he want? And I actually think that teases to the core issue, which is most people don't know what they want. Are you, would you say you're a passion business entrepreneur? I love business. I love business. Would you do, would you do things that, for example, I had a friend uh, approach me years ago and was saying how much money he was making from, you know, it was really super popular. It probably still is to do the Amazon drop shipping thing. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me about all the money that he's making. And I'm like, oh, that, that, that sounds really cool, man. Like, like, what are you selling? He's like, uh, sh uh, plastic shower caddies to put your soap on yeah. that I get from China. I'm like, what? You're interested in making shower caddies? He's like, no, 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 no. Like I just get them from China. I don't yeah. give a fuck about the shower caddies. Yeah, yeah. But I was making, I was like, why do, why do you care to sell shower caddies? Like I'm making money. Like, I guess it's just different strokes for different folks of, you know, do you like making money? There's a balance of the passion and it's not necessary to make More the passion it is around. Like, I like the game. I want to like, we're like said differently. I love looking at a marketplace and finding where there's a supply demand mismatch. And I know, and I love talking to, you know, to, and negotiating with these third party, you know, manufacturers and getting the stuff over here for as low as I can. And I love marketing it so that I can get all these people to buy it. But he's, he's passionate about finding the opportunity rather than the opportunity itself. Like it's the hunt that he's passionate about rather than the product that he's passionate about, which is fine. It's all fine. You can do whatever, you know, like there's a million ways to make money, um, or really a million ways to live. Uh, it's just, and that's not good or bad in my opinion. Yeah. But the guys who, the guys who are super passionate about the product and become evangelists for it, in my opinion, they go the biggest, the furthest because they really are. It's and the only reason for that. Not only reason my, the, my bet for why one of the biggest contributors is uh, people who think that way, think in an infinite time horizon. And if you can play on an infinite time horizon, it's hard to beat you. It's hard to beat an infinite player because you never win because they never stop. I agree. What everything that you, you've said is a very, like you go so in depth with it and it seems like your knowledge is of infinite expansion. Right. And uh, it's cool to hear you talk. <laughs> <laughs> talk to me. <laughs> Say words. You probably, face. you probably like hearing yourself talk with the, with the head, headphones on. It's right? a trip. I'm still like, I feel like I'm echoing some. first ever podcast that yep. you've done with these first ever. What do you think your biggest single trait is that has allowed you to get to the, where you are now? Man, you know, the first thing that came to mind, Chipotle luck. I mean, a little bit of luck. I mean, there's the luck skill. You got a lot of luck. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think you're lucky? I was born in America. I was born to a higher SES income family. Uh, my dad was a doctor and I was an only child. So I got personal training from a doctor on how to human. A lot of people don't have that. I, I, I was born genetically gifted for muscle. I put muscle on really easily. I can tell. I, I had a bilingual family. So French was my first language. English is my second language. When you have, when you're born, like I didn't pick that. I just got that, but it, it develops better language centers. So you are, you're able to take on more languages faster, more easily. You have better vocabulary if you're bilingual or more. Um, I, I mean, and if the, if the average person around me was a physician, then the, then the, the, the words that they're using are higher. You know what I mean? It's just higher grade level in general. Um, and so like all of those things together, like I think, the stars were already aligned for me. Uh, and so, yeah, the single greatest thing was luck. I already was like at the five yard line. That's like a really, that's not the answer that I would expect really from anyone. What, what would you tell the people who don't have the luck, which would be the majority mm -hmm. of people, right? Of, yeah. and, and you know, there's a lot of people and even individuals that I know of, woe is me, everything bad happens to me. There's this black cloud following yeah. me. I'm, I can't be successful because of this, because of where I live, because of the, like, what words do you tell people who have the complete opposite upbringing as you, well, you that want to have, that yeah. want to be, be you? Well, you, you stay in poverty until you learn all the lessons that poverty has to teach you. And the first two words that get you out of that is my fault. And so even though it may be true, that you were not born in America and your parents hated you and you were born with one language and everything was stacked against you. 
as long as you keep your finger pointed outwards to all the reasons that you can't be successful, you will guarantee that you are not. But until you say like, well, what things are under my control? And the fact that I'm not doing at least those things is my fault because those are the only controllables. And then just piece by piece, brick by brick going from there. Damn. What an answer. <laughs> Didn't expect to get so deep on this podcast. Eh? Amen. This is good, man. <laughs> well, I don't want to, I want, I want to kind of wrap it up because sure. I know you're a busy man. You got to make 800 pieces of content after this. Yeah, of, you millions. Know, why not to spend any money cooking your food? <laughs> And uh, I just want to say it's been an honor to, to meet you, man. And um, again, I'm a relatively new follower of your content. And it's uh, really cool to see what you've done, what you've built. Is there anything like uh, what's next for Mr. Alex? We're going to uh, continue mastering the mundane middle. You know, the start's fun. The finish is fun. But the middle is the, is the part that no one wants to do. And that's, that's what we will do. We will do the work. And you're gonna, are you going gonna to get to the... I don't, I don't want to disrespect and say the hundred million dollar man, obviously. Do you think you're going to, you, you're going to get to the billion dollar man? Yeah. I mean, unless I die, I mean, that could definitely happen. <laughs> I mean, fucking AI robot comes and smacks I mean, me, dude. I could die. I mean, very, I mean, but I, I think on a lot of high horizon, like, cause thing is, is like, we're on a, on a conservative estimate, we're worth probably about a hundred million bucks now. Um, you know, if I valued the other things more then it'd be higher than that, but like conservatively it's about a hundred million bucks. If I do nothing, uh, over, if I put all of that just in the S and P and did nothing at 30 years from now, we would be worth over a billion. So if I do nothing, we'll get there. And so as long as I don't lose money and do something really boneheaded, so it's like, I can't die and I can't do something to get me to zero. So those are kind of my, my two big risks. And so as long as I don't make bets that would get me to zero and I don't die, I think there's a high probability that we'll get to a billion. Wait, 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 you said something there. You said you're going to put all your money in stocks and you're going to be worth a lot more that's not what's happening to me because I put all my money in the, in the stocks and I have less money. Well, you got to put it in now. <laughs> you got to buy the fucking dip, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a, the never ending Eight dip. months later, it's like it's it's still 40% dipping, down. Well, you got to buy more of the it's dip. More like, of the dip. And you're like, I don't have any fucking money. Yeah, there's no more dip to buy. <laughs> the dip uh, keeps dipping, man. Yeah, well, yeah. thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm going to put all of your socials, businesses, books yeah. down in the description. If you guys are... If you haven't, if you're living under a rock and you don't know about them, go check them out. A lot of knowledge, knowledge. Uh, you know, and doesn't film it in his garage. <laughs> really exciting stuff we had here. Hopefully uh, my jokes didn't come off too stupid. And uh, well, I mean, dude, you can deadlift more than a crane. So, I mean, that's all that matters. That I was my biggest takeaway. I really can. <laughs> <laughs> you're telling me a crane can deadlift over six. Dude, you should do a YouTube video of you versus a crane. It's the old John Henry story. You, you know? should do it. You versus a crane. Well, I would win. I know. That's 1, why it would be a viral percent. video. Actually, one, one more question. Dude, you're, you're a jack, dude. What are, your, what are your three max lifts? What are your bench squat and deadlift? I haven't maxed out in years. Um, that's, that's someone who doesn't have a high max would say. I don't know. I did 475 for 20 or 17. So Wait, on what? Oh, deadlift. Um, 475 for 20? 17, I think. I gotta t I check, I've tried to count the reps in the video. It was a lot. Tap and go? Yeah. Straps? Straps, yeah. Okay, you, you did about five reps. That's all right. <laughs> no, I, um, I think I, 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 I benched 390. Uh, I got four or five. I'd be four or five is like so close. Yeah, like. I know. Yeah. I benched 390. Um, I squared a four or five for 20. Um, four or five for 20. Mm -hmm. I was bigger though. Those like fucking legs, man. They're big. Those legs. They're big. Those Birkenstocks. Yeah. <laughs> did you squat in the Birkenstocks? No, 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 <laughs> no. Um, no, but I was bigger then. I was two, I was two thirty five. How much do you weigh now? I like two fifteen ish. Never in my life. What's it like to be over 200 pounds? Cause I will never in my life be you over. You could totally be over 200 pounds. No, I promise you, man. Do you, you see these legs? You think, you think the mass is going to go here? It's not going here. I can squat. I've squat, I've squat 501 pounds in competition yeah. with these little fucking ham hocks. It's amazing. The mass doesn't apply to me. I don't gain weight. Well, I, so not I mean, eating enough. Take whatever you want. But, um, you know, I had this thing where I couldn't get over 200 for a really long time. So like I had trained for, guess what was I? I was 20, 23. I've been training for eight years at that point. And so that was the last time I powered. So when I was 181 and I was 21 was the last powerlifting competition I did. Um, and that's when I, I was at 181. I did, I think four, 470 ish for squat and deadlift. And then I benched 340. 
when I was 20, 20 or 21, whatever that was. Um, and I just, I was like, I'm a hard gainer. And I looked, uh, honestly, I looked, I had a very similar build to you. Sounds like an excuse, right? Yeah, it was. And it, I was like, I've been training for eight years. I'm already past all my newbie gains. Like this is all I can achieve naturally. Um, and then I read uh, this thing by John Meadows about insulin. And I was like, huh, okay. Not injecting it, just like eating more <laughs> carbs. Um, and so I started eating more carbs. And then I started living with a guy named Greg Knuckles, if you're familiar with him, if you're in the powerlifting world. He's friends with Sonic, right? <laughs> yeah, right. That was um, a good joke, right? Yeah. <laughs> Greg's strong as shit. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Greg's can he, can he deadlift more than a crane? Uh he can he can deadlift more than you. Um <laughs> he's very strong. Uh and he basically reframed my whole thinking around a lot of stuff with volume. And so he got me going on way more volume than I was used to from the powerlifting days. And so, you know, I used to only train pretty much like six and under. You know, like I like anything over six is cardio. You know what I mean? Um it's all about reps. Yeah, there you go. And so, yeah, reps, right. And so I started training 10s, 15s, 20s, 25s, 30s, you know, in terms of reps. And I just blew up. It sounds miserable. Oh, it was horrible. Um, and I started eating like a tank and um, eating a lot. And I, I grew. And I, it had been after almost a decade. And I, you know, I was an advanced you know, lifter at that point and I competed. And, 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 then, and then I just started doing all this volume and I never really went back to powerlifting. That's why I, like those rep, the rep ranges when I was like 17, 20, all that stuff. That was because I just never needed to max out anymore. I just didn't. I didn't care. I remember like I, I, I would hit a PR and I would look around at the gym and no one gave a shit. No, I make sure to, <laughs> I, I, I have like a deadlift ritual. I jump around and kind of go, Whoa! I make sure that everyone in the gym is watching when I'm deadlifting. That's, that's good. Um, I've always had, most of the time I've had private gyms. So like I haven't had people around me. So it's mm. just been like a silent victory of myself. And then I'm like, you know, my Did hips, anyone see that? Yeah, my hips kind of hurt and uh, no one cares. And no. so I just, I was like, you know what? For me, what was more functional was looking jacked. And so I transitioned like that, like I remember because earlier on I was like, that's not functional, like blah, 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 blah. And all my powerlifting buddies used to make fun of me because I would stay afterwards and like do delts, you know what I mean? And like do my calves and stuff like that. And they'd be like, ah, he's got a good speech body, you know, whatever. Um, but it was way more functional for me to look jacked in my life. Every video I use it versus, you know, whether I can, you know, wait 12 weeks, do a shitload of joint stress and then like add another, you know, 15, 20 pounds to my deadlift. I mean, to be honest, it's, it's kind of, I've been powerlifting for a long, long time. Yeah. And it's like, what's the point of being so strong while looking like this? You've motivated me, dude. 2023, we're going <laughs> to 200 pounds, ladies and gentlemen. You could do it. I'm going to, I'm dead fucking serious. The amount of, the amount of food that I would have to eat is like, a, a, it's not enjoyable. It sounds like you're saying it's hard. No, it's versus it's, I can't do it. No, no, no. I'm saying like back in college days, I would do the, you know, cup of oats, milk, peanut butter, yeah. you know, olive oil, sure. all that shit. I'm yeah. like, I don't want to fucking drink that anymore. So it's just was, so getting to 200 is not enjoyable for you. Correct. Okay. Well, yeah. And, so it's not that you can't do it. You just and I would, here. the process of going from like 175 to 200 yeah. and to look good at 200 would, the process to get there, I would hate the way I look on a daily basis. You could do it slow. 2024, we're getting to 200 pounds, ladies and gentlemen. I've been inspired. That will wrap up this episode. Make sure if you're watching on YouTube to comment, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And if you're on any sort of podcast streaming service, first of all, go to YouTube, but then leave us a five-star review. Thank you so much for tuning in. Eat more sour strips and ever forward. That was fun. Appreciate it. Get acquired. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, man. Dude, I, I couldn't get past, like, dude, I had like serious, uh, like 182, I was stuck there for fucking ever, 191, I got stuck there forever, and then I cracked at 205, um, I stayed there for a long time, and then that's when I started doing all that volume stuff with Greg, and then that got me to like 220, and then I did another cycle of that, um, and I got to 235, and I was all like,